Okay, our next speaker um, is Eric Rubin from Merkin Co, and he's going to talk about novel strategies for drug development in cancer and an industry perspective. Eric, you're very welcome. So first I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Chabner for in inviting me uh, to talk about uh, Merck's strategy in oncology drug development, especially for following my former mentor, Dr. Livingston. So you may have seen versions of this slide before, which is a scorecard for on oncology relative to other therapeutic areas for about the past 50 years. So you can see that in contrast to heart diseases, cerebrovascular diseases, and infections, uh, we really haven't uh, done too well in oncology in terms of decreasing mortality rates. And it's well known that oncology drugs have a higher failure rate in phase three than, than other therapeutic areas. Um, about half failed due to lack of efficacy, a quarter due to failure to improve on available therapies. And so we really need uh, higher bars and better drugs. In addition, for drugs that are approved, such as this one, uh, that's now a standard of care for, for this particular disease, you could argue that although these survival curves, the difference between the um, previous drug and the current drug, the previous drug is the gold and the new drug is the blue, that although statistically significant, um, is really not a huge uh, win for patients. So Merck's approach to this, uh, similar to others, is to try to find the right drug for the right patient. And this slide shows the preclinical uh, efforts we're using for that. So we like to use a knowledge-based target selection. We're using synthetic lethal screening quite a bit, and I'll take you through an example of that. Uh, and we also in use next generation molecular profiling uh, to identify uh, our, our best targets uh, and then use chemistry and pharmacology to advance those uh, to the clinic. On the clinical side, uh, we spend a lot of time on target engagement assays uh, to make sure that uh, we're hitting the target before we proceed. We like in phase two to have what we call a killer experiment, which is a, it may not be a large population, but a population that, uh, that should respond to the drug, and if it does not, then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll kill the drug. This, of course, requires a, a functional test that's CLIA certified. And then finally, in phase three, uh, we, our approach is to, to find subpopulations in phase three uh, that will benefit from the drug, and again, this requires co-development uh, of a diagnostic test. So to do this, uh, we've invested in uh, 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 collaborations that, that uh, uh, may be of interest to you. One is a collaboration uh, with Moffitt, uh, where Moffitt provides uh, uh, biopsies from bas basically all patients who uh, enter their doors. Um, uh, there are over five years uh, to provide about 25,000 samples. Uh, we're now, I think, at a, at a, you can see the figure over here, we're in the several thousands at this point with a variety of cancer types. Um, that en encompass both primary and metastatic uh, tissues. So we obtain and uh, share MRA profiles uh, from all these specimens. Uh, in addition to mRNA profiling, we're also exploring whole genome and exome sequencing, as well as genome-wide methylation analyses. We've also expanded this uh, to Asia in collaboration with Lilly and Pfizer, uh, where the idea is to collect uh, several thousand lung and gastric tumors uh, uh, samples as well as associated normal tissue, and to build a similar beta database of molecular uh, as well as clinical uh, uh, data that will allow correlations and identification of uh, new pathways as well as uh, uh, responsive subpopulations. So I wanted to give you one example of uh, how this is translated into something that we're now using in the clinic, uh, and this is a, a RAS gene signature. Uh, Again, uh, you're familiar with the importance of the RAS pathway in cancer. Uh, we took the approach that uh, having a signature would be useful in identifying uh, K-RAS mutant tumors as well as wild-type tumors that had uh, a RAS dependency phenotype. So th this slide uh, shows that uh, we're, we were able to do this. This is really based upon uh, Moffitt data. This is an example of a, a, lung, a lung tumor panel where the red bars indicate uh, uh, tissues that uh, contain mutations. The blue in, is the RAS signature score, uh, and you can see that um, uh, many of the uh, non-mutant patients have a high RAS signature score, similar to that of the, of the mutant patients, and that uh, if we look at, if we define a, a, 
uh, patients as having the high signature score as being RAS dependent, we, we approximately double the population of, of tumors that we would think would be susceptible to, to a RAS targeting therapeutic. Uh, we've also shown that uh, the signature correlates with sensitivity to, uh, uh, as expected, to drugs that target uh, AKT, our AKT inhibitor, MK2206, uh, where, where uh, this, this RAS, high RAS score confers resistance, whereas in contrast with the MEK inhibitor, we see the opposite phenotype. So uh, one of the issues uh, in drug development that I, I think you'll agree with uh, is that the most effective treatments require combinations. Um, really, our, uh, most of our curative therapies involve drug combinations. And these are the principles uh, that really have not changed over many years. The idea is to have additive or synergistic anti-tumor activity without additive toxicity. However, and, and pr accomplishing this in practice is actually fairly difficult. And we've been using two approaches that, that uh, we hope will, uh, will result in, in more rapid uh, advances in this area. Uh, one is, as I mentioned before, using synthetic lethal approaches preclinically. Uh, and the second that I'll talk about are, are new clinical designs, new clinical trial designs that uh, hopefully will get to the most active combinations more quickly. Um, so this can be called a combinations problem. Uh, and uh, the traditional clinical approach of multiple phase two trials with exploratory or retrospective biomarker objectives really doesn't work. Uh, uh, the, there are too many such proof of concept trials to, to prosecute cost effectively. So for example, if you have 10 new drugs in a, in a field, that gives you about 45 concurrent trials, uh, and that's without uh, uh, biomarker enrichment uh, uh, strategies. In addition, targeted drugs are unlikely to be effective for all patients in a given cancer type. So again, you do need to, there's a multiplier there that you need to be concerned about in terms of finding the, the predictive subgroups. And I'll give you an example of that a little later in the talk. In addition, the traditional development pathway of determining the maximum tolerated dose, followed by a CT-guided efficacy study and then a pivotal phase trial, uh, is inefficient and really hasn't worked very well. So I'm going to, the remainder of the talk, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of, of how we've tried to do, do a little better. One is we try to identify promising combinations in a little more agnostic fashion preclinically. I think it's very easy in, in, in to put two drugs together and, and come up with an argument that they they, sh they should be a good match, and indeed, uh, there's a host of, of preclinical data that one can, uh, where one might show that these are additive or even synergistic, but in many times when those combinations get to the clinic, we find they're really not effective. So we ha have two that we, we are particularly interested in. One involves a combination of an IGF-1R targeting compound with an mTOR targeting compound, the other with an AKT inhibitor and a MEK inhibitor. And again, the second part is, as I mentioned before, is to use new approaches uh, to uh, combination trials that are adaptive in nature, and uh, examples of that are Battle 2, which I'm going to talk about, and as well as I Spy 2, which I'm not going to talk about. So, with regard to uh, the preclinical approach, uh, as I mentioned, we do use uh, enhancer screens using siRNA or shRNA libraries, as depicted here. Uh, d d these give us candidate enhancers, which we then uh, validate. So, a good example of that is uh, this. Uh, figure which shows a screen for um, enhancers for our uh, for MK0646, which is a, mon a monoclonal antibody to IGF-1R. So what these dots are are individual shRNA um, results, where the x-axis is proliferation. So um, dots that are more towards the left, uh, there, there's an anti-proliferative effect um, of the shRNA, and the y-axis is basically the p-value with with higher being more significant. So you can see there's a lots of dots here with a real outlier up here, um, which is uh, the mTOR gene, FRAP1. So again, this th in an agnostic fashion really identifies uh, this particular combination as being something special. And happily, the converse was also true. So if we, if we switched it and screened for enhancers of the mTOR inhibitor, rodafrolimus, uh, we identified IGF-1R as a top hit. So this provided a, 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 a rationale for, for the combination. Happily, this made sense biologically. Uh, it, it, had, it was, had been shown, uh, some of this work uh, done by Dr. Baselga, that uh, there's a feedback loop um, that if one inhibits cells with an mTOR inhibitor, you, you activate the AKT pathway. Uh, and so by, by blocking that, 
uh, with an IGF-1R uh, inhibitor, for example, uh, w one could uh, stop this uh, feedback loop. In addition, uh, in, in uh, uh, preclinical mo animal models, we, we, our data showed that this combination indeed was uh, synergistic. So this is one slide uh, of a patient on our phase one clinical trial of this combination. Patient uh, with breast, high proliferation breast cancer, ER positive, PR positive, HER2 negative, and, and high KI67. Uh, this patient uh, had four prior chemotherapy regimens, three prior endocrine regimens, and had a, a quite dramatic response to this combination uh, with a confirmed and sustained partial response, improved pain, uh, uh, and as well as a decrease in, in a tumor marker. And indeed, uh, four out of seven patients with this uh, phenotype, this high proliferation luminal B type phenotype, have had objective uh, evidence of response. So quite striking response rate uh, in, in our phase one trial. And we're pursuing that. We've actually just started a, uh, a phase two trial uh, in that population with that combination. So uh, we also have uh, a, a, an approach that, uh, again, is a, we hope is an agnostic, in an agnostic way will help us define these types of combinations that involves uh, what we call the oncopolypharmacology, or OPP. That's a robotics-based system that uh, involves uh, hundreds of cell lines uh, with uh, two different drugs um, and a matrix of uh, interactions uh, where you get up to into the millions uh, of combinations. Uh, so this is, a, and I'll show you one example of this, um, output from this, um, on this slide where there's a, a measurement, this actually should be HSA, uh, of synergy, uh, and again, a p-value, uh, and, and uh, down here it just shows this, this synergy uh, uh, parameter is based upon a 2D surface type uh, assessment of, of uh, drug interaction possibilities. Um, and, and so using this particular model, we identified a particular uh, combination as being highly active across multiple cell lines, and this was a combination with uh, uh, AKT inhibitor and a MEK inhibitor. So this, uh, this is also supported biologically by understanding the pathway as well as by uh, uh, cellular experiments that indicate that uh, um, uh, pa pathway uh, uh, flux is uh, inhibited to a much greater extent by the combination than by either single drug alone. And this, uh, in part, led to our uh, collaboration with uh, AstraZeneca in combining our AKT inhibitor uh, with their uh, MEK inhibitor. Uh, this was one of the, the first such collaborations in an early stage. Uh, and we're in the midst of the phase one trial uh, with this combination uh, uh, currently. So I'd like to uh, um, uh, uh, talk now about uh, clinical, uh, the clinical approach that I mentioned before. This is, again, back to what we would call the combinations problem. This is an example of lung cancer, a simplified example, where if you, if you take two standard of care drugs, in this case, let's say, for lotinib and bevacizumab, and let's say you're a company that has five new compounds that you're interested in, in lung cancer uh, listed here, and maybe you would say that matching those compounds might be four predictive biomarkers that you'd be interested in. So if you just do the multiplication, you get to 20 possible all-comer phase two trials, um, if you look at the biomarker groups, assuming they're independent, which may not be true, but for simplicity, we'll assume that's the case, you get to 16 possible subgroups. So you do the multiplication, you're up to 320 possible enrichment phase two trials, which of course is not feasible. So how, how can we, uh, wh what's the approach here? Well, one that we became very intrigued with was the approach taken by uh, the lung cancer group at MD Anderson, um, and really based upon adaptive statistics from Jack Lee and Don Berry. So this is the battle trial, which you may have heard about. It was presented at AACR plenary uh, this year. So battle stands for biomarker-based approaches of targeted therapy for lung cancer elimination. This is really an umbrella trial uh, that has four sort of separate phase twos in a second line non-small cell setting. So the, the battle group, uh, they were interested in uh, um, four bi biomarker groups uh, and realized that, again, they had uh, uh, that uh, results could be positive or negative for each of these four, giving you 16 possible groups. If you multiply 16 times four, again, you get 64 combinations. That's too many phase twos. So wh what they did is they used a, a clustering approach and separated the biomarker groups into five hierarchical groups, which yields only 20 possible combinations, which, which was feasible for them in a, in a single institution study. 
Importantly, they used adaptive randomization to identify the most active treatment. So this, is a, this means that as patients enter the trial, uh, their probability of being assigned to one of the arms according to their biomarker group changes as a function of how other patients have done in the past. And uh, statistically, uh, with only 200 patients, um, although this is a Bayesian adaptive, it's not a frequentist type trial, it yields uh, type 1 and type 2 error that uh, are not dissimilar to, for typical types of phase 2s that would be more traditional. So this is again the schematic for the for the trial, um, the, uh, so all patients entered the trial had a biopsy, uh, and uh, they were randomized uh, to initially equally and then to this adaptive design that I mentioned. Here are the four different treatments, erlotinib, uh, a, a VEGF inhibitor, vendetinib, uh, erlotinib plus bexerotine, an RXR inhibitor, uh, or a serafinib. The primary endpoint was an eight-week disease control rate. So I don't have time to take you through all the results, but uh, um, I, I, I'll, I'll mention some of them quickly. So here again are the, bio, the five biomark four biomarker groups that I mentioned. There's also a, a fifth, which was basically patients not having that, that group. And so they were EG, an EGFR marker group, a KRAS or BRAF group, a VEGF group, and an RXR or cyclin D group. These were roughly designed to match to the, to the arms that were being studied. Uh, here's data that argue that the eight-week disease control rate is actually relevant as an endpoint you can see that uh, it does correlate uh, uh, with survival um, and patients who, uh, uh, with a p-value of 0.02, patients with disease control at eight weeks had a, had a greater median survival relative to those who, who did not. And here's the, the, the results uh, according to uh, ARM and biomarker group. So first I'll draw your attention to the overall uh, response rate, if you will. It was 46 percent. So Again, that's pretty good for a, a, a second-line lung cancer population and argues that this is actually good for the patient. So, so patients are, you could, one could argue, are being uh, placed onto trials that match their characteristics more closely. If you look in, in sort of some of the particular cells, you'll see that for a lot, and not surprisingly, patients who, who have EGFR mutation uh, uh, have a fairly high response rate, in this case 35%. One of the interesting ones was serafinib, uh, which had been studied in all comer lung studies and had been negative, was identified as having a very high response rate in patients with KRAS or BRAF mutation, 79%. And, it, and indeed, I think that stimulated uh, some additional uh, work on serafinib as a treatment for those patients. So we're uh, working with MD Anderson on what we call battle two, which is a, a next iteration of this uh, idea using uh, combinations that we're interested in. Uh, and these are a combination with our AKT inhibitor with erlotinib, as well as the, the MEK AKT in, in, uh, combination that, that I mentioned previously. It's the same type idea where patients will be stratified according to biomarker groups. Initially, it, th this will just be EGFR mutation and KRAS, um, but we have a, an interim analysis where part of the trial, the beginning part of the trial, will actually be looking to identify uh, additional predictive biomarkers. We call these group two biomarkers. Um, these include a variety of pre-specified uh, biomarkers that have been picked uh, in collaboration uh, with uh, MD Anderson and us, as well as uh, with uh, um, their investigators as part of their program project grant. So I'll just comment, though, that one of the other issues with uh, combinations like the igf and mTOR or the aki mech is that um, there's a challenge in, in getting two new drugs approved at the same time. Again, you might agree with me that uh, this is that if we're really going to accelerate drug development in, in cancer patients, uh, this is uh, important. Um, there's currently no precedent, and FDA guidance and regulations have lagged. There's, there is something called the combinations rule uh, in, at the FDA, which is really based upon combining two approved products in, a, in one pill. Uh, Merck has actually done this very well in, in uh, other franchises where one can combine an antilipid drug with an antihypertensive drug in one pill. Um, that's more convenient for the patient. But it's not really the same idea for cancer, uh, and these really, these, design, these uh, requirements really, f uh, f uh, you have to, uh, for approval, show that th there is a unique effect of the combination relative to either monotherapy. If we followed this in, in oncology, we would actually have to enroll patients onto typically a forearm uh, phase, uh, phase three pivotal trial where patients would be exposed to uh, treatments, monotherapy treatments that uh, would likely be ineffective. So happily, 
the FDA has recognized this and, and uh, is coming out with guidance very shortly that uh, will uh, allow both in oncology and in other therapeutic areas uh, more rapid uh, development of and the possibility of having two new drugs approved at the same time. So finally, I want to end with uh, just one other thing that, that uh, we're doing that uh, we believe is important in rapid drug development in oncology, and that's a collaborative trial uh, network that's worldwide. See, the idea here is that we want to improve the efficiency of pre-proof of concept studies, and we're interested in sites uh, uh, like the one here that are interested in new designs, complex uh, biomarkers, uh, um, and adaptability. Uh, we hope to maximize efficiencies through long-term relationships with these uh, with these sites, uh, and that uh, things that uh, can take a long time, in, in, such as administration, contracting, legal uh, aspects, uh, w will be uh, minimized. Um, so we have sites now. We have 17 sites that uh, we're working with worldwide that include, in addition to sites here, sites in Europe as well as Asia Pacific. Um, these are shown uh, schematically uh, here. And I, so I'd just like to end thanking uh, people from Merck uh, who uh, have helped uh, with this strategy, including Gary Gilland, Steve Fawell, uh, Elliot Barr, uh, Keevan Anderson, our, our statistician, and others, as well as uh, collaborators from AstraZeneca who are, who are listed here uh, that have been important with the MEC uh, inhibition, uh, Dr. Basalga, who's been very important in the igf one r mTOR combination, and colleagues from MD Anderson, uh, including uh, uh, Roy Herbst, Valley Papamudakpulu, Jack Lee, and Don Barry, who have been important in the battle design. So thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer questions. Okay, questions. I was just wondering how you, uh, I was wondering how, if you could say a few words about the REST signature you presented, how you checked it for specificity that it's really REST specific, it's not proliferation or PI3 kinase uh, specific. The reason I'm asking is that, yep. yes, there was REST signature published in the literature, which was based on primary cells in transient transfection. And for the past five years, with Tan Inche from Bob Weinberg's lab, we have produced several um, yep. stable, you know, uh, transformed cell lines, and we couldn't find anything uh, specific of REST signature that could be, uh, you know, uh, applied to patient population. So we do have, actually, we do have uh, PI3 kinase and proliferation signatures. And so although there is some overlap, the RAS signature is about 100 genes or so, it is different. And one of the, so one of the ways we got this, though, was from uh, primary tissues. Again, it goes back to the Moffitt situation. So this is where we, we looked across multiple cancer types, again, uh, looking at uh, cancer, those cancers that had RAS mutations that, that are across different histologies to, to get the signature. So. Chris. to try to integrate uh, the EGF inhibitors or the pathway inhibitors with, with other target inhibitors. The problem I see with this is that is there really any understanding of biomarkers for the EGF response? Yeah, probably others in the audience can answer that better than me. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not sure. I mean, but, you know, so one of the issues is, is you're right. I mean, if you had to sort of bet on picking a biomarker ahead of time, you probably would have a, have a tough time doing that. Um, one of the advantages, though, of this type of approach is that you can't, there can be a discovery component. That's what we're doing for the, for the other one, where you can use profile or something else, a, a more agnostic way uh, of doing this. Um, and just one, one comment I'll say about because I was on a, a panel with Richard Simon uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, where uh, he is also, uh, um, he's also published in the, in the idea of, of uh, arguing that we shouldn't, we should be a bit more open to both identifying and validating predictive biomarkers in later stage trials. So he's he's uh, he's uh, published an, uh, an idea that for a pivotal phase three, one could actually start the trial not really knowing the right biomarker. Uh, at some point through the trial, stop, identify that um, potentially predictive biomarker, and then the rest of the trial, you know, uh, validate it. At the end, one would have both an approved drug and a biomarker. Interestingly, the FDA at this meeting uh, seemed to be okay with this. I mean, we'll, we'll see uh, in practice what, whether they would allow such a thing. But I, I think it does get around this bind of, uh, of uh, and that's one of the arguments even for battle one, is that some of the original biomarkers that were picked really, in retrospect, probably weren't the best ones.
Yeah, so again, Mace, maybe we talked about that yesterday, I had about Mace earlier. Uh, um, I, I think that this is a big issue, uh, um, and, and part of it, again, is that it's not to have uh, something that really works in the clinic is not trivial. Translating the, the, the basic assays to the clinical assays is very difficult and costly. So again, from a development perspective, you have to decide when do I make that investment. Particularly, you really have to do it oftentimes before you really know if your drug's going to work or not. A question here that uh, I think that adaptive design is really a, a great idea to, uh, you know, speed up the process. It's here. You know. Oh, hi. But I, pre I present a counter argument that is, if you have a side effects, uh, you have a combination of two or more, so which drug are you going to blame when you find the cause of it? Or it's a combination of the two maybe causing this unique clinical side effects. How do you deal with that? You may have to go back to monotherapy somehow. <laughs> So it's a good question. At, at one level, I would just say that, that I think it's very difficult to attribute side effects to one drug. You, you can argue, even if you're, let's say you have, you're, you're adding on to a drug that has no neuropathy, if that's occurring, you could argue the second drug is actually making that pre-existing side effect worse. Um, but what you're touching upon, though, is really the issue of sort of dose for the two drugs. And so uh, it is an important area where um, when you combine two drugs, you may find that they're synergistic not only against the tumor but against the normal tissue, right? So, so uh, that, that's an important part that gets back to having um, the right target engagement assays to make sure that uh, in the early stages you're actually making sure it's a viable combination and that you're, in terms of finding the doses, you're finding the best possible doses between the two compounds. And again, we and others use, are using adaptive trials for that as well. Any other questions? Okay, well, Eric, thank you very much for a wonderful talk.